joining us today, and her name is Dawn Innocencio. She is actually a, a banking center president. So she has worked her way up through the ranks, you guys. She's been in this business for 20 years. So she really is bringing a lot of expertise to the table today. Uh, she has been there working in retail areas of banking. She's had a focus on business development loans. Uh, she educates business owners about how to help them grow by informing them of all the services that are available. Now, I need to let you know, this is actually part two in the series. However, even if you didn't see last week's, today's is still going to be incredibly helpful and incredibly useful. So the topic, just so you're in the loop here, is money smart, banking services available for, part, for, for small businesses. Part two, part one is up on the YouTube channel as we speak. So if you missed it or even want to review, it, it, it lives there on Sarah's YouTube channel. And that's incredibly helpful because you can go back and piece this together. If you were with us last week, then we are continuing on with our education from Dawn. So what she's going to do is go through a presentation for all of us. And then at the end, we will do Q&A. However, what I'm doing over here is taking notes. So I'm coming up with my own questions, but more importantly, I want to hear your questions. So as we go, if something comes up, a term that she uses that you're not familiar with, or um, uh, some, some phrasing, some strategies she's speaking about that you want her to go more in depth on, or if you have a specific scenario you're dealing with, now's the time. We have uh, access to her for the next hour or so. I'm not going to waste any more time and I will send it right over to Dawn and Dawn, take it away for the presentation. And then you and I will chat on the back end. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, again, I'm Dawn Innocencio. Thank you so much for everybody uh, attending today and wanting to learn more about our business banking services. Uh, this is information that's provided by the SBA. So I'm sharing that information with you. So what I wanted to start with today, since part two, um, I focus more on business lending. Um, we're going to go over that. Now, this I just wanted to highlight. Anybody who uh, printed out the guide that I included with this presentation, this is definitely something, a good exercise for you at home. Um, it gives you your plan of what you're going to do in six months, 12 months, two years from now, and how you're going to achieve it. And then you revisit it yourself to make sure you're on target. So I just wanted to point this out because it's very beneficial for you um, being in business. Now, part of the business banking fundamentals, um, reconciling accounts, they're talking about deposit accounts, your de remote deposit scanner, which we talked about last time, it could be called um, RDC is the abbreviation for it, but it is a remote deposit scanner where you have at your office and you scan checks in. Um, it's talking about interest earned and loans are some of the topics that we're gonna touch base on. Um, so another part of the business banking fundamentals, protecting your business from online theft. This is all listed in there as well, um, but it's just highlighting security of your account, making sure that you have strong passwords, um, avoid public wireless hotspots because, you know, it's not as secure and uh, making sure that you monitor your bank account daily. And make sure you're, um, don't save your passwords on, I mean, you know, we should all know this, but don't save your passwords if you're using a shared computer. Okay, so um, I apologize. One of the things that I failed to mention when I was talking about reconciling, I mentioned this last time, but just to reiterate, when you reconcile your bank accounts, we recommend uh, viewing your account daily is what I recommend because you never know when you're going to have something suspicious or something you know you need to look into to notify your bank of and you want to reconcile your books monthly. Um, so the big piece that I feel there's going to be a lot of questions about uh, is commercial lending. Um, commercial lending is a broad, there's just a broad range of, of products and services that banks offer. Um, you could look at financing receivables and purchased inventory. Uh, lines of credit and term loans for fixed assets. So financing receivables and purchase inventory, um, you know, say you need to purchase inventory for your business, we can look at financing that is what that's talking about. Your financing your receivables um, is like your accounts receivables, the, the receipts that you have and the invoices you have that companies owe you the money. So that would be what we call AR, which is account receivables. Lines of credit, um, Lines of credit have lots of uses. They're very beneficial for you. I recommend uh, getting a line of credit when you don't need it, because then when you need it, you have it available to use. 
um, because when your business is hurting and you don't have the same amount of cash flow, you might not qualify for a line of credit. So you want to really look at it when you don't need it at the time. And um, how how we do lines of credit is we're going to go in the first lien position when it comes uh, to your UCC filing. So we're going to do a bank blanket lien on your business. And uh, what that means for you is we're going to go into first lien position. So if you do a line of credit with us and, you know, hopefully not, but if you happen to default on the loan, then we take first lien position for all your assets. So we're going to look at your account receivables, your assets, any inventory that you have and any equipment. So that's your collateral, though, that we're using for the line of credit. So it's very beneficial. Sometimes businesses think, well, I don't have any collateral. Well, you have your office equipment. You have your inventory. You know, you might have some cash. You know, if you own the building, you have the building we can use. So there's lots of things that we can use for collateral. Um, and lines of credit, one of the things you want to highlight on there is the rate is floating. So depending on Wall Street Journal Prime, um, the rate can change. So it's not a fixed rate by any means. So you just want to make sure you're aware of that. And um, you can you could typically do any amount of lines of credit. So you just want to check with your bank to see what the options are. And then they'll go over rates with you and talk about if there's a floor. A floor is the minimum rate the bank is going to charge. The ceiling is the maximum rate the bank's going to charge. So we might say hypothetically say the rate's going to be 6% as the floor. And then the ceiling will be 18%. So that means anywhere from that 6% to 18% you could be charged on that loan. Um, that doesn't mean that's going to be what you're going to be charged. That's that's just what the rates that we have to give since it's a floating rate, which floating is uh, variable. Um, okay, term loans for fixed assets. So you're looking to buy one piece of equipment or a business vehicle. You know, sometimes people want a business vehicle in their business name to start building business uh, of rapport with the bank. Or you um, have machine, like a machinery or um, an F-350 because you want to start doing trucking or a big rig. So that, that's what would our fixed assets would be, and we would do a term loan for you. So it would be an installment loan, and you would have, you know, repay with a fixed rate and then monthly payments that we would go over at the time. So you want to make sure you understand, and our job as an expert in banking is when it comes to lending for me is when a customer tells me what they need, then I help them decide what's best for them. I help them come up with that solution of, well, this is what you really need. Because if I have someone who tells me, well, I want to get a line of credit and I'm going to use all the money, but I'm not going to pay it back for a year. That's more of an installment loan. You would want to do monthly payments because on a line of credit, you need to have um, our lines of credit have interest only payments. So you want to make sure you still have um, principal performance, which means you're going to go in on your own behalf and just make a principal reduction payment or submit the payment towards principal, what we call principal um, performance, because we want to see that you're paying down the line. So a line of credit is for, um, let me give you an example, like short-term working capital. So you need the money to pay employees, uh, buy equipment, you know, pay for your business expenses, and then your invoices, for instance, are going to get paid for 30, for 30 or 60 days. Well, when those invoices get paid, then you turn around and you pay the line of credit down, and then you can pull from it again. So on ours, we do annual reviews every 12 to 24 months, just depending on the line of credit. So we're going to review the line of credit and we're going to check for several things. You know, we pull credit and we're also going to look to see if the, uh, the principal was, you know, you were performing on that principal as well as making the interest payments. I know that's a lot of information. Um, so those are just some examples of what can be offered. So we had talked about this again a little bit last time when it comes to business debit cards. So now it's business credit cards. Um, you could definitely, we do business credit cards. Any bank will do a business credit card for you. They'll go over the requirements of what you need. Uh, typically there's an application and financials you'll need. You, you might need two years business tax returns, two years personal tax returns. Um, in our case, we, we do two years business and then we get an application. And then you'll need your corporate documents entity documents, whatever you want to call them. It's like your sole proprietorship, your articles of incorporation, certificate of filing. You'll need that information as well. Um, and then but with the bank that you present that to, see what the options are, see what the interest rate is, see if there's any fees associated with it. And make sure just like with any loan, anything that I'm talking about, make sure you know your options. Check out a few different banks. You know, we want you to get the best 
um, the best deal for what you want, the best term, the best rate. We want to make you happy. So you need to check around with a couple banks to decide before you um, pick one. Uh, so I get a lot of questions about SBA loans. Uh, hold on. SBA loans can be very beneficial. I get asked about SBA loans quite a bit, but when someone asks about an SBA loan, they're like, someone told me I need to get an SBA loan. And, they're, and they are good and they do help you. But some of the things I wanted to highlight about SBA loans is you wanna make sure, um, you know, if you are working with somebody with an SBA loan, you're not gonna have as fast as a closing time. So on a conventional loan, you know, with appraisal and everything, you know, you're talking maybe a couple weeks um, with an SBA loan, it could take 45 to 90 days. So you want to have that expectation that you're not going to be in a hurry. And, um, you know, and as long as you have that expectation to take the time, because once a bank or a direct lender, for instance, the bank I work at with Prosperity Bank, we're not a direct lender. Um, so the process could take a little bit longer. But if you have a direct lender like Lift Fund or People Fund, um, they can also do uh, smaller micro loans for SBA. And, um, but the turnaround time could still be longer because once we submit the package to the SBA, we're dependent on the SBA approving it. So, you know, that can take time. So you just want to know if you want to go SBA, um, SBA does have some benefits. It does help you with, um, better terms, sometimes better rates, maybe your cash flow and your credit's not where you need it to be for uh, the banks to do a, a traditional, like conventional loan. So that's where the SBA can come into play. And I recommend um, our minimum for prosperity is $250,000 to do an SBA loan. So if you're looking for a smaller SBA loan, Lift Fund or People Fund um, can do that. And then when we get to the Q&A section, if anybody needs that, I have their website addresses. Um, so when it comes to the C's of credit, what we look for is credit worthiness, cash flow, and collateral but you also have capacity and character are some of the other things that other places look at. But the three main ones that we look at again are credit worthiness, collateral, and cash flow. Um, make sure, I've, I've mentioned this before, do your homework, ask questions, uh, check around with different banks, write down what they have to offer and then decide what's the best for you because you wanna know what you're getting into. You wanna know any fees that are associated with it, the time it'll take to close because you might be trying to buy a building and it's you know going to take 45 to 90 days to potentially do an SBA loan, and you not you might not be able to still have that building. So you want to make sure that you know what you're getting yourself into. Uh, again, build relationships with your banker, whoever that banker may be. Make sure you know somebody at the branch, and you know we want to grow with you. So make sure that you develop that relationship with the banker because um, they need to know what your business is and and how they're going to help you grow. Uh, improve your personal credit score. So with us, we only pull personal credit. We don't pull business credit and we pull through Equifax. So it's very important when you're looking at doing a loan with a bank um, to know where we pull and report from, you know, because if you're building your credit and you're trying to improve your credit score and you're working with a bank that reports to Experian, and then you come with me to do a loan and I'm pulling from Equifax, I'm not gonna see anything that was on there. So you just got, you gotta make sure to do your homework in the beginning. And um, again, we only pull personal credit. And then if there is a late payment or a negative payment, we're gonna report to your personal credit. Um, it's just very important to highlight that because people think when they get a loan, a uh, business loan that we're helping build credit, and we're reporting monthly on-time payments, but that's not the case, um, at least for where I work at Prosperity Bank. And uh, so if that is what you're looking for, you know, make sure to ask the bank up front. I haven't come across a bank that, that does that. Everybody just reports to personal, but it's definitely good to ask if that's what you're looking for. Okay, so I already highlighted this comparison shop, you know, check around. That's what I was talking about with the rates and the terms, making sure that you understand what you're getting yourself into and understand the different types of financing, which we will help break it down for you. Like I mentioned, um, if you're purchasing a vehicle, that's one thing, purchasing a piece of equipment, we'll explain the process and break down what you need. And then if you're needing just a certain amount of money, but we know you're going to pay it over like a monthly installment, then we're going to set you up on a term loan not a line of credit. If you can't pay the line of credit back right away, 
then if, if you haven't paid anything, say you borrow 10,000, you pull the full 10,000 off and use it, but you're not, you don't pay us back for 12 months, only make your interest payments. We're going to review that and then we could term it out. So you'll be back on a term loan and then, I mean, you'll be on a term loan and you won't be able to pull from it. So it's just very important. Um, but that's why, you know, if you're talking to your banker, explaining what your needs are, we're going to assess what you need and help you come up with that solution. Okay, so this just highlights the fact of asking about the loan details that I mentioned, uh, features, terms, you know, depending on what you're getting, we might be able to do only 24, or I'm sorry, 12 or 24 months, uh, which is like our line of credit. We'll renew it every 12 to 24 months and we will pull credit again. Um, but depending on an age of a vehicle or the equipment, sometimes we can only finance for 48 months. So that's just throwing some examples out there. Uh, definitely ask so you can determine your payment and make sure that it's affordable. And the different loan types, we already went over that as well. Um, and then some of the things that you'll need to provide, for instance, are um, like an application. We have to get that for compliance with our bank. So we're, I'm going to have an application that I'm going to send you and help you fill out. Um, you, We typically need two years business tax returns, two years personal tax returns, a business financial statement, and a personal financial statement. But rest assured, when you meet with your banker, say for like myself and you explain what you're needing, I send all my customers a checklist of what I'm going to need up front. Now, just because I don't need it up front doesn't mean I might not need it later during the process. So I'm going to go ahead and give you that um, up front and let you know this is what I need now. But once it goes under review for underwriting, I might need some additional financials. So just have them ready for me just in case. So I prepare everybody for that, have clear communication of what we're going to need and send a checklist for expectations. So it's just very important. You should have that with any bank that you go to so you know okay they don't need all my tax returns up front they just need two years but they might ask for additional information and then you will need to um with us you do have to establish a business bank account so you're going to need to know what the name of your business is um, and have it filed whether you're doing a sole proprietorship a corporation an LLC. you decide that um get with a tax accountant, uh, I'm sorry, a CPA attorney, however you wanted to file it, unless you're filing at the Dallas County Clerk's Office to get an assumed name certificate. And then, and, you know, we'll need those documents where we're doing the loans for the most part. Um, but it can be case by case. You know, if I have an individual, for instance, who has a truck business and um, he, they don't have a business name, but they're doing it under their name and they file their tax returns showing their business income, then we could look at financing it in their name because it's still their business. They're just an individual doing business as. So make sure to ask those questions and determine uh, with your banker what you need to do and what you need to provide. Um, now these additional services that I'm gonna mention, this would be how it mentions here, like with your wealth, wealth management, um, your, your investment rep at your bank, typically each bank has one. We have a wealth management um, and investment reps that we work with and they can go over your planning for you when it comes to the stuff that's listed here, like your simple IRA, your 401k, um, your set plan, which would be for your business, uh, simplified employee and your IRAs, and because there's two different types of IRAs, Roth and traditional, and your health savings plan. So it's important that you get that information from somebody um, who is in wealth or that has to do with re retirement planning because I do have customers throughout my years that'll come in and ask me the difference between them or what's more beneficial for them, but we cannot give guidance. Um, you have to talk to your tax expert or um, the person, your tax advisor that's giving you the information, and then you come into us and we get it open for you. So, and each bank will offer something different, so make sure to check with them. Um, okay, key points to remember, make sure to choose the right bank for your financial needs. Definitely, we, as banks, we know that you're going to shop around. We want you to have the best bank for your needs. Um, all banks offer a wide range of loan and deposit products and services to meet your needs. So again, shop around. <laughs> um, keep your personal and business accounts separate. We talked about this last time. We call it commingling. Uh, you don't want to do that because when it comes to anything, loans, the IRS, your accountant, your bookkeeper, you know, they're going to want the things separate so they can review your bank statements if needed. Whatever the information is, it's very important to keep it separate. Uh, make sure, you know, have that separate business account. And then if you pay yourself by check 
you know, through your accounting software, whatever the case may be, then pay it over to your personal account and use your, your personal debit card for your personal expenses and only business expenses on your business account. Take precautions to avoid fraud or other preventable losses. Uh, one of the things that they mentioned in here is when you're an employer and you hire somebody um, doing background checks, you know, because uh, a lot of times there's inside jobs for, um, you know, embezzlement, security against your business. So just make sure you take the added measures that you feel would be beneficial for your, your business to protect it. Um, establish a cushion for unexpected expenses, um, perhaps in a savings account. So of course, like an emergency fund. So for your business, uh, what people tend to do is maybe take three to six months of what their business expenses would be, just like you would want to do for your personal side and have that in a business savings account. So if you were to need it, um, the money would be available for you. And so ideally three to six months on expenses. Know your personal credit credit score, of course, um, because that's what it's solely based off of. We don't actually, we don't base our, just, I'm sorry, let me clarify. We don't base our decisions solely based off of credit. We look at the three things, the cash flow, cl collateral, and credit score. But credit score, you would want to, you know, keep your credit score up and discuss options if you needed to improve your credit score, such as taking out a secured loan or a secured credit card. A lot of times I get people that ask me, well, why would I secure a loan if I had the money? Why not just pay for the service? Well, you're building your credit. So if somebody brings us money, we loan you money against your money. You use our money instead of your money. So we're like holding on to your money, your nest egg. We're lending you money against it. And then we're reporting monthly on time payments as long as you paid on time. So then when the loan's paid off, you know, 12, 24 months, whatever you set on the terms, you get your money back. So we, you know, you were able to build your credit off of that and then you get your money back. So there are some benefits to it. Um, build a strong relationship with a lender before, during and after the loan process. So of course that once you get your banker and you develop the relationship with them, um, there should be several follow-ups where we're checking to see how your business is going, assessing your needs. And then if I talk to somebody and we're gonna revisit next year, or six months from now because they need time to build their financials or build their cash flow, then I'm going to make sure to follow up with you as well. Um, because I want to make sure that I'm involved in the process and I know where you're where you're at. So if you need me, I'm there for you. All right. So that actually sums up the presentation. So we're going to start with any questions that you have. We'll start off with this when we talk about avoiding fraud you know everybody says yeah we want to take steps to avoid fraud can you talk about some of those specific steps that every business owner should be taking um there's a couple of steps that i would point out first is one monitor your account daily yeah. because whether you have your bookkeeper who monitors the account or an office assistant or yourself if you notice something suspicious to help avoid the fraud or further fraud is to catch it faster. You know, you catch something a month later, the bank might not be able to get your money back. You know, businesses don't have the same protection that consumers do. Consumers have a time frame. They have a lot. Yes, they have a lot longer. It's called um, right. E. They have a lot longer that they can dispute it. When it comes to having a business account and being a business owner, we'll try to dispute it. But some of them, you know, the time frame is not the same. You know, some charge will come through and you only have 24 hours but we don't know until we're looking at it. So that's why it's very important um, to check your bank account. And, and, and I've always wondered, yeah, that's great advice. Cause I kind of, and I know that you said that in the main presentation, check your account every day. And I'm kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. now, I mean, that really drives it home. Not that I would ever, yeah, 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 you, Don. I know that you are. No, I know. <laughs> um, but it's like, oh, that's a lot. But, but it really makes you see how important it is because if you've only ever experienced fraud on a personal account, and that's all you know, then you go to, oh gosh, two weeks ago, a month ago, two months ago. It sounds like it's not going to work because how, I, I guess, wh why is that different for businesses and individuals? It's consumers just have, you could look up regulation E, consumers just have different protection and it's just, it, we just don't have it on business accounts. And, and just because you don't notice something within 24 hours and you notice it within two weeks, you can still dispute it with your bank. I recommend just trying to dispute everything you can if it's fraudulent and let them know what's going on. And then the bank will be able to tell them if they were able to get the money back or not. Because you could have a fraudulent payroll check 
you know, I did have somebody one time that had a fraudulent payroll check. The check got mailed to the employee. Um, the check was stolen out of the mail and then it was fraudulently endorsed by the employee. You know, someone just picked up the check, endorsed it and deposited it into an account and they tried to get credit for it. And we were able to send that back. Um, and, but another thing to pre help prevent fraud besides monitoring your bank account or having, you know, a service to monitor or somebody in your office is uh, what I like is positive pay. So positive pay, there are fees associated with it. Um, there, and then if, if you're not a check writer, then positive pay wouldn't be for you. Check, positive pay monitors check payments coming in. You're going to go on a list on your online banking and update what check numbers you wrote. And then if you upgrade your service, we have a service where you can do just the check number or you can do the check number and the payee. So if they present it to their bank or they come into one of the um, banking centers, we're not going to pay it unless it's registered on their positive pay list. And it's, and it's updated pretty quick. So as a business owner, if you go in and update your list, um, there has been an occasional time where we have to call the owner and figure out if, you know, if we can get it paid for them, but it has, it's caught fraud. You know, I had someone trying to cash a check in a banking center and the check was altered, um, where it looked like it was made out to a person, an individual and come to find out the check was actually made out to a business originally. And it was put into a mail. So it was taken somehow from the mail, you know, however that process happened of how the check was stolen. And when they came to the banking center, I knew something was off. I called the business owner and then I was able to uh, call the police. I, I called the police. I called the police and they apprehended, you know, the suspect. Right. Don, I didn't know we were going to get into uh, like Don calls 911 on here. I will call 911. <laughs> so when you did that, um, did you, how did you keep the person there, the man or woman there in the branch? Or did they have to go find, track them down later? Uh, no, they were there in the branch. So just to highlight the fact, I don't have to deal with this so much anymore um, because I was more of a banking center manager at the time. So I was more involved in that process and I had to do approvals. Now I don't have to deal with that so much. But we were, I was able to keep them there. You know, it only, the cops, there was like five SWAT cars that came um, there. <laughs> and so it only took, it didn't take very long at all. But I did have to talk to the suspect with the police in front of them. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's not, you know, the check was not made out to him. So I just, <laughs> I, was, I guess I just was like, you're going to jail. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. I, I know it was off topic, you guys, but I found that to be fascinating. Don't you? Okay. Um, yeah. This is a really great question from the audience. And I think so many of us want to know how people rise through the ranks in their own business. So they're wondering what your, was it an educational background that led to you becoming a bank center president or was it rising up through the ranks? Talk about how you, you know, got the job that you have today. Okay. Great question. Um, I do have an educational background. Um, I have an associate's degree, but my educational background is not what got me here today. It was just my hands-on experience going through the ranks. So I started out, you know, 20 years ago as a teller and then moved up to a new account representative or a personal banker and then, and then took it from there to a teller, super vice president. And then, you know, so I went up that, I went up through the ranks and I've done most of the roles and, or actually all the roles in the retail branch in the banking centers. Um, and that's how I got there. Yeah. That's great to hear. So that's interesting. It wasn't, I didn't know if somebody went, yeah, went to, to get a degree specifically for that, or if it's more like you learn the skills and then you move up. I learned the skills and I moved up. Do you ever have somebody that gets a degree? Is there such a degree to like a bank president degree? Not a bank president degree, but people will get, um, depending on what aspect that they want to go into, they'll look at getting accounting or like a credit analyst. So they'll be, uh, cause in my role, we're more on the, we're more a commercial lender in essence. So they're going to go and get like the credit analyst degree from what they've told me. And then they get into banking, get a, to be a credit analyst, and then they move up to commercial lender. My route was a little bit different um, just because I went up through the ranks differently. But sometimes people will go to college for like banking. There are colleges, I believe like SMU that spe specializes in banking. Oh, very interesting. Uh, this is a great question. Does your age, and we're gonna jump all around, you know how it goes with the Q&A, we jump from topic to topic. Um, <laughs> from Dawn chatting with the person that was soon to be arrested to asking about, does a person's age affect the bank's decision on the loan you're applying for this person's specifically asking um as somebody who is more advanced in age 
Uh, she's considering herself to be elderly. Do you take that into consideration? No. Um, and what I mean by that is we would never, that would be discrimination. So we're going to go off of your application, your credit, your cash flow. You know, you might have your business income and then another source of income. We're going to go off of all of those factors. Age is definitely not a factor. We do not look at that because the bank would be discriminating against you. Period. End Period. of sentence. Yes. I think that's really important that you highlighted that because we all can wonder if we were declined, we can wonder, okay, was it this, was it this, you know, so that's good to hear. Um, what about on the alternative end, if somebody is, you know, just getting started out and they're thinking, oh, I'm, you know, I'm only 20 and I'm looking for this loan, would age matter in that instance or would that be considered discrimination as well? Um, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't talk to them about their age. That's never, I don't ever address that. Um, I mean, as long as they're over 18, because we have to, you know, have that to be able to pull credit. And our applications will say, are you over 18? Um, but I just look at their history. You know, how long have they been working? What kind of income did they have? How long have they been in business? There's several factors of what we look at. So no, age still would not be a factor um, because they could have gone into business when they were 18 and show the cash flow and then have another source of income. So no. That's great. That's great to hear. Uh, let me know the other questions, you guys, and I'm going to keep going rapid, rapid fire with my own here. We talked a little bit about fraud and about security and checking your accounts. What are the risks associated, if any, of giving an employee a company credit card or debit card? Well, in my opinion, the risk would be the same as having your own. I mean, they say you give them a card and it's for gas. They could still fall victim to a scammer at the gas pump when they input the card. So as long as you notice things right away and report it to the bank, and then most banks have where you can set limitations. So you don't want them to have the full limit that an actual debit card comes with or a credit card. You can lower their limit, you know, $100 a day or $500 a day. You can talk to your bank about doing that. And that'll help lower your risk because if anything goes above that, it'll decline. And then you could take away. So debit cards will have an ATM cash withdrawal limit. So if you don't want them pulling cash out of the ATM, then just talk to your bank about limiting that as well and see if that's an option. Okay, getting a question about the SBA helping out with business loans. I had a feeling that somebody would want to go back to that topic and, yeah. you know, and and how that works and what that would look like. It sounded like it was different based on which amount you were looking to borrow. Is that accurate? Yeah, so when it comes to SBA loans, um, I don't work directly with the SBA loans. Um, uh, and then Prosperity, we're not a direct lender, but we still do SBA loans, but our minimum is, again, 250000 So when you go through like Lift Fund or People Fund, they specialize in larger loans and smaller loans, so what we call micro loans. So if you're looking for like a 10,000, you know, 5,000, 15, all the way up to 50, they have limitations and they can help with the smaller SBA loans. And that's if maybe your credit's not where it needs to be. And they'll go over all this with you as well. Um, so I highly recommend contacting them going, you know, I'm looking at getting a small loan, um, you know, explain to them maybe your credit's not where it needs to be, you don't have the cash flow or you're a startup business. When you're a brand new startup business and you have no cash flow, that would be an option for you of visiting um, with them for those smaller amounts uh, to see if they can assist you. That's great. Let's go back to the earlier chat on your presentation where you were talking about first lien position. What, what does that mean exactly? Uh, that means if you owe us money, we get to take everything first. <laughs> Um, so if you take a loan out for us and, and, and let me clarify really quick, if, if you do like a vehicle loan or a piece of equipment, you know, and say something happens and you do default on the loan, which of course we would want you to be able to make the payments. We're just going to take that piece of equipment or, um, that vehicle we're not, it's not, um, we wouldn't do a blanket lien on all your assets. Primarily when we're doing a blanket lien on all your assets, it, all your business assets is like a lot on a line of credit because you're saying these are all my assets. Um, this is my office equipment. So we're going to go into first lien position because if you end up owing us the money, we're going to, we're going to be the first bank in line. If I find out like you're trying to do a line of credit with us, with me, 
and then you have a line of credit with another bank, we won't be able to do it because you they already have you in first lien position. So prosperity will not go into second lien. Some banks might, but we don't. So that's what that means. They're, they're going to file a blanket lien, the UCC filing a blanket lien on your assets. So once we pull that up and we find out about it, then I address it with the customer. Are you wanting to pay off that, lien, that line of credit and just go with us or whatever the case may be? And then we'll talk about it. If a customer does a business vehicle loan or a business, like a piece of equipment, like a fixed asset, and the place that they went through the financial institution or the financing company, if they did a blanket lien, then they really need to address that and refile it and only put the lien on the piece of equipment because that will hold them back from getting a line of credit elsewhere. And you wouldn't really know until you applied elsewhere to do, at least in my opinion, we don't know until we review it. Okay, that's really helpful. Uh, lots of SBA loan questions, and this is, and some of these. And Dawn works for, you know, Dawn works where Dawn works, but she can answer to the extent that she's able to. Uh, asking if credit unions give SBA loans. Oh, that's actually a great question. Um, because I'm definitely not an SBA expert, but I was involved with like the PPP loan process. Okay just throwing that out there, the payroll protection plan, uh, program. So I, I did SBA loans and got people PPP funding from start to finish. Um, but I don't know, I should know that answer. Um, you can't know everything, Dawn. <laughs> I'm drawing like a blank here, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> totally, totally fine. You cannot know everything. And this is a great question. If you're a woman on disability, wanting to start up a business, is there a special small business loan you can qualify for that, that you're aware of? I know that's a super specific question. Um, repeat that part for me. They're on disability. Yes. And uh, on disability, just wondering, and they want to start a business. Is there a, a particular type of small business loan you could qualify for if you are on disability? Well, how we look at disability is like any other income. You know, so I never, you know, I asked them where their income's coming from and they put it on the application, but I'm, we're still going to look at it as a source of income. Um, and then if we, if the customer needs like a smaller loan or they're trying to purchase um, a business vehicle, we're also going to look at that as a source of income and then figure out how long they've been getting that income or if they have any other income. So it's not, we don't have a, um, a specific loan. We don't have a specific loan. We help everybody the same and we look at their income as one of the factors. Yeah, I remember that was one of the things that you that we spoke about last week was you were saying, uh, you know, it's it's a it's a regular it's regular income coming in. So they'll be able to show the history of that just like they would a, a regular paycheck. Oh, thank you, Karen, for saying bless you. I muted myself just in time. <laughs> just, just in time for the sneeze. I was like, oh, we gotta gotta mute before the sneeze. Now, when it comes to the lift fund and the 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 people fund, are those just those are other funds where people can get loans from. Is there anything in particular that people need to know about qualifying for those types of loans or, or would you just submit the application like anywhere else? Um, well, they, what I would recommend is going to their website. Cause I even pulled up their websites just to check the information to make sure I still had up-to-date information. Um, because they, they, the benefits from them is they help with the smaller loans or if your credit and your cash flow isn't exactly where it needs to be, or you have a startup loan. So um, we typically will look for two years in business, but if I have a newer business that's trying, and it depends on what they're trying to do. So we look at every single request that comes our way. I would never turn anybody away for not being in business for two years because we would be discriminating against you. We, we want you to come in and we want to take care of you. So if I have someone who's trying to get a piece of equipment, but they've only been in business for a month, we might be able to do that because they do have um, the other source of income. It's a good piece of collateral, you know, and their credit's where we need it to be. But what I like about Lift Fund is if someone needs, um, maybe we can't help them. Maybe they tried to get help at a, at a bank, a financial institution, because Lift Fund and People Fund are not financial institutions. Um, they, they help out um, their community development, CDFIs, community development financial institutions. But so they're not like us, so they can help out with different lending that maybe we might not be able to do as a, as a bank. That's a helpful distinction, I think, because you work in your industry, it's all super clear. And for everybody who doesn't, it's like, oh, okay, it's a totally separate thing, separate fund, but could potentially work if, if something with a bank doesn't work out. 
Yes. When, when you reference a micro loan, is there a certain amount that is like, I, I, can you define that? What micro loan would be? Um, I mean, any amount, a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand, because when we go, when I said micro, I meant with the SBA because SBA with us, we could, we only do 250,000. I know that's a lot of money. You're like, I don't need that much money. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a lot of money. So the smaller loans is what I meant by micro. So if you're like, well, I just need 5,000 or 10,000, then I would recommend you can, you can try with us conventional. You can try with a bank. I'll look at any request that comes through. Look at your cash flow, your credit, get an application from you and talk about financials. And then it doesn't work with us, then you can go to Lift Fund or People Fund. If you're specifically wanting SBA, then, and it's a smaller loan, then I would recommend uh, Lift Fund and People Fund. Okay, that is very, very helpful. Now, what happens? You, we, we talked about first lien and all of that. What happens if somebody, has these amazing plans for a business and for one reason or another, it does not work out and they do not pay back their loan. What does that process look like? Um, well, I don't handle the process myself firsthand. Like I'll do the collections and I'll call on some of our loans and I'll call the customers to try to make payment arrangements and get payments. But as far as that, we're going to, um, you know, for instance, if I have a business vehicle, and we've had non-payment for so many months, we're gonna repossess the vehicle. And that's just an example. Again, we're gonna re repossess our collateral. Same with business assets. You know, if we have your accounts receivables, the invoices that your customers are gonna pay you, um, we'll come in and we'll go in first lien positions to get those paid to us and your office equipment, you know, whatever we're using as collateral. Yeah, you know, we'll, have okay. to, we'll have to come in, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I just think it's important for everybody to know, you know, just, you know, how it all works and, and what happens. This is a, a great question. Uh, does it affect your credit if you go in and go through the loan application process, but you are denied for that loan, if you don't get the loan? Um. Well, there are several things that could affect your credit. If you're coming in and you, okay, so on credit, there's multiple factors, but loan inquiries or inquiries in general is what I'm, I mean to say. If you're going to um, a, a bank and you get declined, then you go to another bank and get declined. Every time someone pulls your credit, depending on what your credit, you know, what's going on with your credit, it can pull your score down. Uh, but if your credit's above average and you get declines maybe because of cash flow, but then you're able to go to lift fund or people fund and they have to pull your credit again, I don't see it being a huge impact unless you've just had multiple inquiries um, in that past month or six months. I think they, they keep them for 12 months on inquiries, but I wouldn't really be concerned about it unless you were doing it multiple times. And then you already had a lower score. If you have a lower score, that can pull you down more. Um, because of maybe of all the other multiple inquiries you have. And then they also factor in late payments. So if you have late payments or something else going on with it, your score's already been pulled down and then every inquiry you do could pull it down more. So to get in more information uh, specifically based to credit, I would look at those specific websites. Uh, they have Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. And that has additional information in all three credit bureaus on what they look at. And remind me again, which one you all work with. I, re I recall you saying something about that last week. Um, Equifax. Equifax. Okay. Great to know. So when we're talking about the, you know, the, the credit situation, it seems to make sense to me that somebody would want to try to do some research on the front end to find out, especially if they have a lower credit score, you know, am I a likely candidate for this loan? So we're not wasting time with the application process and then potential little dings here and there for applying and applying and applying and, and continually getting denied. Yeah, you definitely want to research. Um, everybody tracks their credit their own ways, you know, whatever program that they use, whatever app that they use. But if you know that your credit has something significant on there, um, like a bankruptcy or repossession, and you need to work on it, I would recommend getting a secured loan maybe at two different banks. So then you have two different banks reporting to the credit bureaus uh, month, you know, or credit bureau, whichever one monthly on time payments and help building it. But if they do want us to look at it, when someone comes in and they tell me they have those things going on, I still try to see what we can do for them because we don't know until we pull the credit and get the full story. And then I will clarify with them 
why the loan was declined um, and then give them some recommendations of what they can do. And then we can revisit it, you know, 12 months, six months from now, depending on what's going on. Mm -hmm. But we yeah. won't discourage, you know, we'll do whatever application. So I leave it in their own, uh, you know, their own ownership, own accord, if they want to, if they want to proceed and I'll at least look at it and then I'll address it with them and revisit it back with them when they're ready um, after I've made the recommendation of what they can do. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So another question here, um, looking for a loan to open a uh, business for substance abuse. What do I need to do to get a loan? Can I apply for a credit card that would give me a large, um, a large limited to start my business? Let's see. I think they're asking, should they look for a loan? Could they just start out with a, with a credit card with a large limit to start off? And then, um, this person's pointing out that they are on a fixed income. Before you answer the question, when people say fixed income, it, it, it is there, isn't everybody on a fixed income unless they work in like a freelance space or a bonus structure space? Or am I uh, interpreting that term incorrectly? Uh, most of the time when people are referring to fixed income, like social security, disability, um, they have like a set amount that they get each month and it doesn't change. When we work full time, depending on if you're hourly, salary, sour, I can't talk, <laughs> but you know what I'm trying to say, depending on what you work, it can change. It can fluctuate. So they're just meaning they're on a set fixed income and it won't change. You know, it might change annually, you know, if they get an increase, but other than that, that's what people mean by when they say fixed income. Got it. Okay. I think that that's helpful for everybody to understand. And then also back to the question about, can I apply for a, a credit card with a large limit to start the business? Uh, you can always apply for it. You can definitely apply for whichever one, but I would recommend meeting with someone like myself or your um, commercial lender would, at the bank that you use and address what you need it for. You know, what, what limit are you looking for? Because with my um, business loans, like a business line of credit or a business term loan or a business credit card, I'm going to ask you what amount you want to apply for. And then you're going to tell me, you know, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 then I'm going to collect financials such as tax returns, a personal financial statement. And then we won't know until we review the full loan package and it goes into underwriting and we pull your credit. Okay. That's great. A uh, question about this. Is there a way to increase the score being held up by t time factor? Robert, can you give more specifics on this? I, I want to make sure that I'm asking your question correctly. Um, he might be asking, saying yes he he's excellent in all categories except for making payments on time is there a way to improve it and robert if i'm interpreting that incorrectly then please let me know um the best thing that i would think of is figure first know which credit bureau has the late payments reported and are we talking about late payment because I, I i'm not a, necessarily a credit expert when it comes to three different credit bureaus so i just want to highlight that but if you have a late payment from 10 years ago and it's still showing up on there, I would recommend going to the site and talking through them and ask them when it's gonna fall off because some, some things fall off after seven, some things fall off after 10 years. If you're talking about a late payment from a couple years ago, that's still gonna be on there, you know, for at least the seven to 10 years. Got it. Now, these pre-approved letters you get in the mail, you know, you get a little mailer and it says, you've been approved. Um, it's they're, they're asking, does it hurt your credit score when you apply for them and get approved or denied when it comes to loans? And I know you're not a credit expert, but now we're on this credit card that we're on this credit train, Dawn. Yeah. No, no, no. That's okay. Because I can answer that. It, it's still a factor of they're going to have to pull your credit. So you still have to think of, okay, how many, do I need this credit card? How many revolving credit cards do I already have? Cause the credit card's revolving. Um, and so do you need it, you know, because they they send credit card offers all the time. So it's junk mail. If you don't need it, if you need it, it's, it's not, you can move forward with it. But even though they've pre-approved you, if you read the fine print, most of the time you're going to call them, they're going to get your additional information. Cause you think, well, how do they get my social? How do they know what my credit's really like? Well, they're just advertising to you. Then you're going to call them. You're going to give them your social and all your information. Then they're going to pull your credit and then let you know if you've been approved or not. But that still goes back to the same thing is, do you need it? Do you need it to help your business grow? If you do, then it is beneficial. Um, but it also goes into factor of how many inquiries you have. Do you have, um, we also look at revolving credit. 
So if you have multiple credit cards on your personal, you know, because we look at personal credit and they're maxed out, then that's your revolving limit. We could have an unsecured uh, debt ratio that we're going to be looking at as well. Okay, understood. Um, okay, going back to that question we asked earlier, it was actually, it wasn't, although I'm glad that you answered that question, even though it wasn't the actual question. The actual question, it sounds like, was they ha haven't had credit established for very long. Everything else is excellent. They are making on-time payments. They are not going over their limits. They're, you know, being just really responsible, it sounds like, except for they just haven't had credit for very long, and that is keeping the score lower, it sounds like. Is there any way to combat that aside from just continuing to live your best life? Uh, I would just continue doing what you're doing and over time it will improve your score. And then you could also, depending on what you're doing, you know, if you've only got a secured credit card and like a, a auto loan payment in your name, maybe get a secure loan at another financial institution up front the money to, you know, borrow against it and then have that reporting as well. And that'll help you report. But unfortunately it takes time and it's not going to be instant. Sometimes people do it and they think, you know, within 30 to 90 days, their score is going to improve, but that's not always the case. It takes time. Yeah. We just, we just keep living. We just keep doing our best guys. Uh, <laughs> they're wondering if, and again, I don't know if this is something, you know, but I'm just going to ask you anyway, do you know if Credit Karma is a legitimate company to go through to boost credit scores? Are you familiar with them? Um, I'm familiar, so I personally don't use it, but I'm familiar with people telling me that they use it. Um, they mentioned Credit Karma and the Experian app. Apparently Experian has an app. Not that I'm promoting for them. I'm just saying they, they tell me about this Experian app and a way where they can view uh, multiple credit bureaus. So I would just look in, you know, look into Credit Karma and then look into the Experian and see if there's um, monitoring that you can do. And then most of your credit cards will have an app where you can monitor your credit as well. And it'll tell you um, who they're pulling from. Mm -hmm. That is good too. Now, let's say somebody comes into you and they are ready to start their business. They are so excited. They have no credit. They do not have credit established. What do you do? Well, what I do is I'm still going to, you know, I'm still going to, if they want to submit the request for me, I'm still going to get the application and all the financials. But since they have limited credit and, you know, experience, it could have an outcome of being declined, but we're still going to look at it. Every bank, um, any financing company you go to, they're still going to look at it, but just know with the limited credit experience there, you know, it could have some difficulties. Yes, understood. Now, is there any way to establish credit if they don't have credit or how can they, you know, they want to be accepted, Dawn, they want Dawn to give them a yes. What yes. should they do? Um, so it would be my recommendation with doing the secured loan options. So with uh, Prosperity Bank, we have, we only have secured installment loans or um, like a secured line of credit. But if you come in and get a secured installment loan, that'll help build your credit with Equifax. Uh, and then you could get with another company or another financial institution to see if they have a secured credit card or another secured loan. And you can do that between two banks. I recommend spreading it out and having multiple, um, you know, at least two banks reporting to your credit bureau to help build your credit. And then make sure if you're getting, um, I don't want you to pay extra interest, but that's the only way to build your credit. And then a lot of times people will buy cash cars. Um, well, you might want to think about financing it if you're okay with the finance charge, at least for a little while to help build your score as well. Um, I mean, no pressure, you don't have to. And if the interest rate's too high, then I, I can see why you wouldn't wanna do it. But if nothing's reporting to your credit, then you'll, you'll never be able to build credit. So if you do a, like, I'm, I'm thinking through this scenario with somebody trying to build their credit, if they get occasionally, you'll get like a 0% loan. Does that not count for, does that count? Like a loan where, or um, it's a really, really low interest. No, that's great. Hey, it's if you so can find the, the lower the interest, the better, because we don't. I don't want you paying a lot of interest. But um, as long as it's a loan or a credit card, and if they're offering zero percent, you want to do it. That's great. Just make sure to check to see if there's any annual fees, and if they are, you know, it is what it is. You still want to build your credit, but just know the expectations and the terms and conditions up front. But the interest rate doesn't factor in how it's reporting to your credit. As long as you're making monthly on-time payments, we're going to report monthly on-time payments to the credit bureau. 
How many, how many cards in your opinion, credit cards, do you think it would be wise to have for somebody who is wanting to, uh, maintain good credit? Hmm. I would recommend, and this is just my opinion. Um, I would recommend two or three, but whichever ones you get now, I would recommend sticking with. Because when you later on, if you close a card out or you get multiple department store cards, all of those show, they're going to forever show on your credit. And it'll, it'll show as a closed consumer account. If you decide, say you go to a department store and you get a credit card, if and that's great, whatever you want to do, but if you close it out, it will show on your credit, um, closed consumer. And sometimes that does affect people. You can either be affected by having too much open cart, like too many uh, credit cards, too much open revolving credit or you've closed too many things, you've opened too many things, there's a lot of factors. So really I would recommend, uh, again, getting with those credit bureaus or credit counseling. They have specific companies um, that, that specifically work on what's better for you. And then you can determine how it will impact your score. But I, I like to just pick um, like two or three main ones. You know, if I pick a department store, I'm gonna stick with it. But I like to get like MasterCard, Visa, Discover, anywhere I can, one that I can use anywhere um, and I, personally like to have the ones that have no fees, no annual fee. And then I just stick with them. Uh, like personally, I have a credit card that I've had for 20, uh, almost 20 years. It's been 19. Um, and I like sticking with that card because it shows that creditor that you have longevity. And then um, when we look at your credit, we're going to look at longevity as well. Um, or at least that's some of the stuff that I would look on the consumer side. When you did a personal loan, I would look at um, on your credit report, it'll show you, like if you pull your own credit and you review it, it'll show you how long you've had the loan. It'll even show you if you've made monthly on-time payments. If you've been late 30 days and maybe three times that year you were late 30 days, it's going to indicate that on there as well. Tons of things are going to be listed on your credit and they don't go away, um, you know, within that seven to 10 year span. So that's why if you had a late payment, it's going to show on there. If you were 60 days late, 90 days late, that, that'll all show on there as well. And so I just recommend sticking to a few because I have seen some people, you know, you're young and you get older and you opened up all these cards and then they maxed them out and then they can't pay them. And then that shows up on your credit and that could pull your score down. Now, Don, do you, uh, back to that conversation we we're having earlier about the company send you the different, the updates and things like that. Um, let's say you have one card with the same company and they say, oh, we can upgrade you to a different card within our company. Is that bad for your credit? Like, let's say, oh, you, you've increased your limit. We're going to increase your limit. Or we have this new Quicksilver card and we're going to, you have the opportunity to upgrade to that. Does that count as a new card? Do you know on your credit report? Um, I no, I don't know, but personally I haven't seen it impact me. Okay. Um, so I, I'm not a hundred percent on that, but I will tell you if they do want to upgrade your limit, do you need that limit? Because every time they upgrade your limit, it is good. But if you say you do charge up that card, it'll show on your unsecured debt ratio. So if I'm looking at your credit and I see you have um, debt that's unsecured on your credit cards that can impact you because you'll have, and even if you didn't charge at all, you'll have the open revolving credit lines. Uh, it doesn't mean it's bad. It does not a negative, definitely, but just, do you need it? Um, okay. you know, so when you talk to, uh, either a credit counselor or, ex you know, Experian, they'll tell you this will impact you if, you know, your limits change, at least from my impression, from what I've been told, they'll tell you that. So I just take a personal thing. Like, do I want them to raise it that additional 1500 or that 2000? Do I need it now? Sure. If they automatically do it then I just let them do it. But if they ask me to call in, then I don't ever take advantage of getting that increased unless I needed it. Okay, Don, you are amazing. Where can everybody find you if they need to uh, come get a loan? Oh, yes, please call me. Um, my phone number is 972-461-1316. That's my direct office number. Again, 972-461-1316. My email is Dawn, you know, D-A-W-N dot Innocencio, I-N-O-C-N-C-I-O at prosperitybankusa.com. Perfect. And, and uh, real quick, I know we're out of time, but the if anybody was interested in the Lift Fund or the People Fund, the website for Lift Fund is www.liftfund.com. And then it's uh, peoplefund.org. Just in case you want to um, get your options when it comes to the SBA lending and the smaller loans, 
I would recommend going to those websites and seeing what they have to offer. And then they have the information, the contact information for you to call in there too. Don, so thank me. you. You've been very helpful. And if you guys scroll up just a little bit in the chat, you will see all the information on Sarah's programs. There are a wealth of programs with throughout Sarah. This is just one of them. So please do continue to join us every Thursday. I look forward to seeing all of you. Uh, we have incredible speakers just like Don, and the replay will be up by next Wednesday. So just six days and you can watch the replay and get all of this juicy knowledge once again. And I look forward to seeing you all again next week. Don, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye everybody.